Hi everyone and welcome to our talk series titled The Role of Scientists on a Planet in Crisis. I am Francisca and I will moderate today's session. This is a weekly talk series organized by Scientists Rebellion, which is an international activist group that engages in non-violent direct action and wants to get scientists and academics to actually act as if we are in a climate and ecological emergency. As people are trickling in, please use the chat to say hello and say where you're from. And before we start, just a few housekeeping things. If you need translation into Espanol or Francais, please click on the icon that looks like an earth ball at the bottom of the screen and select your language of choice. Uh, during the talk, please keep your microphone muted and camera off so we can hear and see our speaker well. If you want to tweet or make social media posts, um, you're very welcome to do so. And please use the hashtag SFTalks um, to do so, so we can find your, your posts and retweet them. Uh, there will be a question and answer after the talk. And during the entire talk, you can put your questions in the chat. But please label them with questions so we can find them easily and don't miss them. And to make the Q&A smooth, we will call your name and then you can unmute yourself and turn on your video to ask your question in person. You can ask your question in Spanish or French and the interpreters will translate for it. After the Q&A, Michael gave a short overview about Scientist Rebellion and at the end, um, we will have time for discussion in breakout rooms and to get to know our local chapters. Um, we also want to ask you if you are using our interpretation service, please indicate um, in the chat that you are and which one you're listening to. This is just for us to get a bit of an idea of who uses the service and if it makes sense to use that next time we do a, a, a series. But I don't want to keep you all waiting too long and, and talking too much. So I give the microphone to Elena, who will introduce our speaker for today. Thank you, Fran. Um, so I am really grateful to have here Esteban today, who I admire so much. Esteban is a biologist, climate activist, and the founder of Ecolix, um, promoter of Shale Mass Fall and Rebellion Costera Global. Uh, so I remember the first time that I watched a talk by, uh, talk by Esteban, it was when I first joined Extinction Rebellion. And with just this one talk, I was convinced to glue my hands in the window of a bank, uh, accusing them of investing in fracking. Uh, he's the, the example of what a scientist should be doing in these dark times. He not only knows about the catastrophe we are in, but he leads by example, dedicating his life to take action and mobilize all over the world. So with, with this, I, I leave you with Esteban. Thanks a lot, Elena. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for the nice words. Thanks for inviting me, Elena, Francisca, Mike, and everyone that are coordinating this. It's an honor for me to be here. Thanks for the patience with me since I've been in so many things in the last few weeks that uh, I couldn't respond very quickly. Uh, but it's great to be with you. I salute and applaud the birth and the advance of Scientist Rebellion. And I think that there is a huge role to play for this movement. Um, I will go on to share my screen. One second. Let's see. Can you see it now? Can you see it okay? Yeah. Otherwise, please let me know. Um, so let me see if I can hide. Um, as, as they were already introducing, this talk is about the, the false transition away from coal with something that is actually much worse than coal, which is gas and fracking. Uh, but this is not, I'm not going to give you a lecture, a scientific lecture, because that's not my purpose here. And this is not only about the numbers of the global warming potential of methane and technicalities like that, which are very important, but this is a really broad problem 
where I'm trying to give you a really big, the broad picture, the big picture of what we are talking about, because sometimes, and usually we scientists tend to fall for the details and get lost in details, losing track of the big picture. And that's why things like this are happening, gas, fracking, the climate crisis. So I'm going to uh, there may be a lot of slides that I will run over very quickly, but it's because I want to give you the big picture of that. And after that, uh, you all will have this PowerPoint with the uh, references beneath each slide so that you can do further research and you can contact, contact me if you have any more questions. So, um, Esteban, do yeah. you want to put it in presenter mode so we see it full screen? Uh, am I not? Uh, it's in presenter mode. You're not seeing it? No, we see it with the side view of the slides as well. Uh, let me, maybe let me stop sharing and start again. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, tell me if it works, does it work now? Can you see it now? Okay. Yes, perfect, perfect. thank you. Then. Then I'll wait. There we go. So first and foremost, um, I was asked to tell a little bit of my personal story and how this is intertwined with this struggle, how I became involved in this. And I am by training a biologist. I spent 10 years of my life working for the corporate world of the Silicon Valley in biotechnology in some of the world's biggest uh, biopharmaceutical companies. I always struggled to find the reason why or what use I could have as a scientist that could actually help people as more and more I felt the dehumanizing impact of being in the Silicon Valley, being in these corporations that although they spouse noble goals of um, health and things like that, they were all about profit. And so I went back to my country, Argentina, uh, with two goals. One was to create a company that would be mostly state-owned, that could have the goal of developing vaccines and health diagnostics uh, tools for neglected diseases, such as Chagas disease, malaria, and many others. As I understood from being the Silicon Valley and trying to push for that over there, that these companies would never tackle neglected diseases of the global south because they're all profit driven and they don't see a market in that. So in the process of that, we got quite far. We got the best scientists in the country and colleagues of mine from the US coming that were going to come to Argentina. Um, we made a great coalition and we were about to get the company to, to start this. But then there was a political shift in Argentina and right wing president Macri was elected and everything was frozen and dismantled. So I moved to the countryside, to the west coast, the west side of Argentina, the area known as Mendoza, which is a famous wine region and a few beautiful place for climbing and so on. Um, and I went there to try to start a community project, an eco project, a self-sustainable community to pursue this other passion. I was not an activist. I wanted to, to see what I could do for the world going local from a local place to build eco homes and reduce our own carbon footprint, uh, which could be naive and knowing that what I know now. And also to start a small version of this uh, biotech project from the countryside in, co in coalition with the local municipal government to help develop the area and build diagnostic tools for something that is completely missing in Argentina. And all of this is part of the reason that Argentina and much of the global south are currently completely dependent on global north multinational companies for vaccines and so on, which are, have also used this to exploit the sovereignty of our nations and to extract uh, resources. For example, Pfizer has used their power to ask Argentina to modify the law protecting glaciers so that they could, because Pfizer is owned by BlackRock, which has big interest in fracking and mining. So it's all connected. And um, to not go on forever with that, because I want to move on to the presentation, fracking came to us, and that's when I became an activist. We were sitting in the world's second largest shale gas basin, known as Vaca Muerta. It's about the size of Belgium. It's a major carbon bomb for the planet. And I realized that this would not only destroy our project, but everything else in the area. 
And I managed to get a copy of a secret study that the government was hiding that was revealing contamination by the first four pilot wells of fracking in Mendoza. And then we leaked this, we created EcoLeaks, inspired by WikiLeaks, but in a very South American and basic low-tech fashion. But it helped cause a lot of mobilization. And we ended up having tens of thousands of people on the streets, making the largest mobilization against fracking in world history. But of course, in Europe, you may have never heard of it. So we really put in, in jeopardy the world's second largest shale gas basin. And as a result of that, as a result of doing activism in the global south, I'm here speaking to you as a frontliner, more than a scientist. And I'm here to show you the consequences of doing activism in the global south, which included my exile. I became the person of Argentina with the highest number of criminal cases than anyone for fighting fracking. The justice system is weaponized to persecute and silence activists. Others were jailed. Others also had to go into exile, into internal exile in, in Argentina. And this is just some of the consequences. Many others have it much worse than us. Um, but this is the introduction that I want to make. And again, the disclaimer that I make is I'm not going to lecture you, wait, um, on, on one specific field, but this covers many fields, including finances, politics, uh, and of course, climate, but also social sciences, humanities, the social cost and the human rights violations of this exploitation and what it entails for the planet are huge. So as I was telling you, we, we built a huge resistance movement against fracking in Mendoza, which is part of Vaca Muerta. This is a link, we all can have this. We built the biggest in the world uh, anti-fracking group on Facebook, nearly 60,000 members. This helped us fight the censorship of the official media and the government, and it continues to be a formidable tool that we use for mobilization. So gas, I call it here the last fossil battleground. You know, everyone kind of agrees that coal has to go and that oil also has to go. But with gas, we are facing a communicational battleground where the biggest multinational companies and many governments are betting heavily on it, on gas and its follow-ups, such as the hydrogen uh, follow-ups. So I, in, I called it the last fossil battleground because this is where we have the ultimate fight in communicating what really gas, what gas is really about and the consequences for the planet and why we all need to move toward a truly renewable energy future and a just transition. So um, there's some really basics that I assume many people here already know. So just to show you, there's many kinds of gas and fossil fuels. In general, you can speak of conventional resources and unconventional resources. What I'm here to tell you is also as a frontline story against fracking is the consequences that the fracking revolution or so-called shale revolution has had and is having and will have for the planet and for the climate. And so this is a triangle that in very general terms shows conventional reservoirs are getting depleted in the world. And as you may remember, the world was supposed to hit a, a peak oil moment in history, but that never happened because fracking was developed in the late 2000s and the availability of oil and gas was exponentially expanded, especially gas. And that's why we are facing what we are facing now because of this shale revolution. And as you can see, the unconventional reservoirs are more difficult to develop, but they're really, really vast. And if we allow politics and companies to go into this full force, there is no planet left for any of us. So in very general terms, again, fracking is the novelty of fracking. What was developed in the late 2000s is the combination of the hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling, which allows uh, the companies to reach much deeper reservoirs where the shale, the bubbles, the oil and gas is trapped in really tight bubbles of low permeability, which requires enormous amounts of energy and force to break that rock, to fracture the rock. It's called hydraulic fracturing because it involves a lot of water, which usually depletes the drinking water from communities to the left, to the extent of 30 to 60 million liters per well over the lifespan of a, of a well. It uses over 600 chemicals that are extremely destructive 
to dissolve and break up and keep open the rocks so that the oil and gas can be extracted. In the process, aquifers are always contaminated sooner or later. The ceiling that the tubing is supposed to have always ends up breaking. The companies are always cutting costs also because fracking is not even profitable in certain economic uh, circumstances. And so they, what, what fracking really means is really the highest example of greed over people and the planet is how far are humans willing to go in the in waging war to nature and the future of humanity to extract the last drop of, of dollars oil and gas uh, at the expense of all of us so this is also another graph with some of the hazards of fracking as i was saying uh, you know, the flow, the flow back water that comes back also brings a lot of contaminants that are pulled from really deep underneath. In the case of Argentina, this shale formation is two to three kilometers deep. And down there is bringing down heavy metal, radioactive materials, radio, for example, the gas that is really highly volatilized quickly and highly carcinogenic at really low concentrations and long distances. Also, there's a very fine, fine type of, um, of sand that is used in the mix that has the function of keeping the fractures open, the pores open down there. And this sand is volatilized also, and it causes a lot of illnesses in the communities around, uh, asthma, and many more devastating consequences, which is all from wherever you look at this technique. It's just insane. You could not think of something that is more destructive and devastating. And that's why many countries of the developed world have banned it. But as I will show you, they are exporting it to our countries and they are importing the products of this. But this is spelling doom to all of us. This is to show you the shale revolution. This is from the US Energy Agency. And as you can see, the true revolution in the sources of gas in this case, as the conventional reservoirs around the world are sooner or later going to be depleted, the unconventional reservoirs are exploit exploiting. And this is just insane because the methane emissions and the destructive ecocidal consequences are tremendous. And, and this is happening before all of our eyes. Why we talk about five for 1.5 or tell the truth, or we read the IPCC reports, but they don't really talk about this. That's why I want to bring this information to you. And I hope that out of this, maybe many things more can be debated and, and corrected and expanded. This is also a very general graph that shows in very generic terms, the global supply shifting from conventional to unconventional fossil fuels over time toward 2040 and beyond. This is something to really keep an eye on. And then going back more to the specifics of this gas that gets extracted in the form of fracking, uh, it's shipped in the form of LNG to Europe, let's say in this case, Europe is the biggest importer of gas in the world. So a lot of the gas that is getting extracted in the US or in Argentina or beyond gets compressed 600 times by bringing it down to minus 160 degrees Celsius and it, and it gets liquefied. And after being liquefied, it's loaded on these huge transatlantic um, tankers that, that low massive, massive amounts and an explosion of one of these would have the equivalent energy to a small scale atomic bomb. These ships also run on very contaminating heavy fuels and the transport from the Americas to Europe adds a further 20% carbon footprint of emissions of methane as these are constantly emitting through something called passive cooling to release pressure. Uh, emitting methane along the way. Believe it or not, I will show you now the carbon footprint of this. Uh, but believe it or not, the governments, uh, including here in Germany, are calling it uh, a climate solution. Um, the shale revolution, and I go, I go back to the US because the US is the birthplace of this shale revolution. And it's not only the birthplace, the US has a vision for world dominance, American energy dominance, as they call it officially. Uh, with the LNG coming from fracking. The US has been able to go from being an importer of energy to being the world's biggest exporter of gas. And this transformation has come due to the shale revolution, which they are doing at the expense of sacrificing their own rural communities and 
indigenous communities around the US and also in Canada that have both led, led the way. But the problem is that it, they're not only leading the way, they're expanding and applying geopolitical pressure for fracking to also expand in Argentina, which is the next frontier after the US is depleted. The next big one is Vaca Muerta. The US is actually building a military uh, base on Vaca Muerta under the guise of humanitarian aid, which nobody needs there. There is no war, there is nothing like that. Uh, but it's, it's actually to, to keep control on these strategic fossil fuel reserves that can supply the world energy for decades. Now, this is also part of the, how I am going to show you that not only is it a problem today, but most urgently and importantly, I, I want to show you the projections of where this is going. And if we as a climate movement do nothing about it, this is only going to grow into becoming the, the dominant form of gas production in the world uh, with tremendous consequences for the, for the climate. As you can see here, the US is expected to provide more than half of all gas, new gas by uh, uh, 2035. And uh, also because of the LNG, now the US is the largest or becoming the largest exporter over Qatar and Saudi Arabia and Russia and other nations of LNG. This is to give you a picture of what we're facing. It's enough to say that we need to leave fossil fuels underground. We all here in this call agree with that. Needless to say that we need to leave unconventional fossil fuels in the ground even more. It's just insane. Unconventional fossil fuel extraction is even more expensive and energy consuming than the conventional ones because it entails going much deeper, as I explained with fracking, and in really complicated techniques to extract. This is, is highly, this is very costly. However, the greed for oil and gas and to keep uh, the abundance of energy for the consuming society of today is leading corporations to go against the Paris Agreement, to go against the Global Methane Pledge, to go against all that your governments and the IPCC and everyone is saying, and they are doing so with complete impunity. While you read the IPCC reports and the Paris Agreement, look at what's really going on. This is the development of unconventional fossil fuels in the world, and the lighter blue are the new frontiers, so-called. So look at the, the you know, trillions of cubic feet of gas and amounts of oil available that are still untapped and they're going after them. The fossil fuel frontier is expanding everywhere before our eyes, and especially in the global south where we are at the real front lines of the climate crisis. So my title was that they're going to replace coal with something worse than coal. So this is part of that, but of course it's not just the climate or the numbers that are matter, that matter, it's the, the human cost and the cost to other non-human forms of life that are dying because of this ecocide. This is from a paper from Dr. Howard from Cornell University in New York. He is a leading expert on methane. And he has published a few reports and studies showing the real emissions of uh, the methane emissions of shale gas and the contribution to, to the climate crisis. So as you can see here, and this is converted to grams of carbon, uh, you can see the emissions in low and high estimates, but you can make an average. Uh, and, and this is the true emissions of, of, of this, all of these fossil fuels. And you can see the shale gas by far has the highest emissions of all, much more than coal. And conventional gas is also not much better. It's also similar or worse than coal. Keep this in mind going forward because we are facing the greatest fraud of our time when governments and companies are telling us that gas is part of the, of the solution and is part of a bridge fuel. By no means I can address all of these lies with one presentation of 40 minutes that I have to kind of run through, but I hope that we can spark the debate and I hope that scientists' rebellion can help us shift the debate on this because this is the last fossil fuel communicational battleground and against us, there's all the companies and all the power are really heavily investing and betting on this. Um, another way to look at this, this is also from another paper which has shown the, the total emissions of methane to the atmosphere in recent years. And as you can see, by far, 
gas was the largest source of this. Along the process of gas extraction and fracking, there's endless sources of emissions through venting and flaring to release pressure and so on that are part of contributing to this cause. But as you can see, frac gas by far has the largest methane contributions of all. And as you all, I hope, know, um, methane is 87 times more potent than CO2 in its global warming potential over a 20 year period. One of the tricks is that they usually use a hundred year as a comparison in which is usually 36 fold higher. It's still a lot and we don't have even 20 years to avert the climate catastrophe. So methane is the key part of this as the UN and the US have actually acknowledged with the global methane pledge. But th those are just words. And I'm going to show you that those words are empty unless we can make them, hold them accountable. While I'm telling you this, and I have made this presentation many, many times for people in Europe. And since I'm in Europe, and I know that many of the people in this call are, I also have kept the European parts because I think it's important that the people that live where the centers of power are uh, can take this information and take action about it. And actually, I think Europe is the one that can define the future of gas because it's not only the biggest market for gas, but also is where we have the strongest climate movement and we have, you have the privilege where you can do civil disobedience without dying, without getting tortured and disappeared and dead and killed like it happens everywhere else in the world pretty much. In the US, there's people in jail like Jessica Resnicek for blocking a pipeline, which they labeled critical infrastructure and labeled it a felony. And she's been sentenced to eight years in jail for blocking a pipeline. So the privilege that Europe has and the potential to actually lead the way, needless to say that it's also the home of many of the multinational corporations that are leading the way on this expansion of fracking around the world. That's why I need to show this to people in Europe. The, the booming of LNG terminals to import even more. There's already an excess capacity of LNG across Europe, uh, and yet they're building a lot more. Most of this is with public funds subsidized by the European Union, uh, put on the PCI list to be able to skip lawsuits and be put on speed, on speed development. And this is something that we have been tackling and we all need to tackle because this is where all of this will come through and vice versa. If we can close the door of the biggest world, the world's biggest market, we could lead, deal a major blow to the expanding fracking industry. Now, this is a report that I really, and again, I will share with you this presentation. I already sent it to Elena with all the references beneath each slide. If there is something that I can encourage you to read is this. The next few slides are about this report from, it's been very recently updated in January from the European Commission. And as you can see, rather than a science report or some official government document, it looks a lot more like a propaganda flyer for uh, good relations with the US and for the expansion of LNG imports, which in the case of the US, you have to know that it is widely understood that the LNG that comes from the US is, is in, the, in the majority is fracked from fracking because the US doesn't have any gas to export otherwise. The, the supplies of conventional gas for the US are very low. And it's because of fracking that they are actually exporting this. Well, the, US, the, the EU is leading the way. And as you can see here, since 2018, when Trump met with Juncker, the imports have exploded and actually have jumped 2,240% from the beginning. So, and the, EU, the EU is proudly championing this and speaking of how much it will further grow. As you can see here, 2,240% increases. And as you can see in the other red trend, um, uh, rectangle I made, they actually explicitly making it a goal for the US to become the major, the major gas supplier to Europe. Now we know, of course, all that's going on with the gas supplies and Russia, and I will go into that, but keep this in mind as we go forward, because this is a key component of the entire picture. Now, uh, look at the, at the cognitive dissonance. Look at how they are laughing on our very faces. 
the left side, the European Commission, this is part of that report, and I have highlighted the last one of the last paragraphs because it's just obscene. They had not even there to write that in the preceding report a couple of years ago. Now they updated it and they actually are actually pushing for this to say that LNG can contribute to fight the climate against climate change and be a good solution for air pollution in the maritime sector, meeting the standards of the International Maritime Organization. Well, not only is this completely false, as I showed you, the emissions of LNG and frac gas are, are actually 40 to 60% higher than coal itself. But look at the other side, I have put this report from the International Maritime Organization, which in 2020 found that due to the LNG use in maritime transport, the increases of methane emissions have jumped 150%. So how do you reconcile those two realities? And this is just one of many um, cognitive dissonance examples that I will show you along the presentation. Now, who are the biggest importers of this gas uh, in the EU? Well, by far Spain and France are the, the ones that have developed the greatest LNG infrastructure historically to be the, the biggest importer. Uh, Spain imports nearly 25% of all the LNG being imported by Europe. But as I showed you earlier, this is growing everywhere and they're being expanded. Germany is planning two LNG terminals. We're fighting with it against that and so on. But I just put an older picture down there to show you um, how omnipresent uh, LNG is in the Spanish territories and how once it arrives through the many, they have LNG terminals everywhere, and then it gets transported by trucks to other regions and even other countries like Portugal and France and on pipelines. And the first ever export of Argentina's fracked gas to Europe was made to the port of Barcelona in February 2020. And that's when we organized the first international mobilization. I went to Barcelona and with XR Barcelona Fridays and many Ecologistas en Acción and other groups there, we made a great demo uh, at the port of Barcelona and people mobilizing in Argentina by the thousands. We connected the dots against, of these things. And this is what we have continued to do with grassroots movements around Europe and the world. And that's been what I've been mostly focusing on, on campaigning and bringing the movements together, raising awareness about this and building international solidarity networks and actions that could grow and actually have an impact going forward. Now, this is all also a part of a global ecocide. And another way to look at this from the global perspective is, is also from a Dr. Howard study that calculated that the that shale, that fracking has been responsible for more than half of all increased methane emissions globally during the last decade coming from the fossil fuel industry, or more than one third of the total increase when you take into account all sources, including biological. This is huge. And even if this has any, uh, we can argue the details, what's undeniable is that fracking and the advance of this industry is a leading cause of methane emissions for the planet. Now, there has been many uh, organizations and papers that have revealed similar things. Even NASA tried to solve this puzzle in 2018 where there was a huge spike in methane emissions during that decade that nobody could find where it was coming from. And NASA, of course, determined that it was from the booming fossil fuel industry. And then at the bottom, you can see an image from Earthworks from the US where you can actually see with an infrared camera from a fracking plant, how this is a constant part of the process, the venting of greenhouse gases, methane, ethane, and many other constantly into the air, but they're invisible to the common, to the normal eye. More studies, this one is for, uh, uh, the news is from California, but there's a study in this article that you can read. And California is one of the first states in the US that has committed to banning fracking, also because it's been causing huge droughts for a, for a, for a state that is very heavily desertified. And then there is a lot of things that many of you may already know about water on fire. You may have seen the documentary Gasland. On the right side, you can see a river on fire in Australia near a fracking site. And this is happening everywhere because of the infiltration of methane into the water, together with many other contaminants that are even worse, that are actually causing cancer, leukemia, 
endless illnesses in my country, children are dying of leukemia at a rate that is three times higher than the national average where some of these wells are located. And these are some of the proven health consequences of fracking. Again, the, the references will be beneath the slides. The, the, the top one is from the uh, Concerned Physicians of New York. They made a really great compendium of scientific articles and medical uh, findings. And they, among other things, they found that living within a 16 kilometer radi uh, ratio distance of a fracking well is linked with a high risk of a lot of birth defects. And then as you can see beneath, it pretty much affects all the systems of the organism, nervous, immunological, reproductive, respiratory, and so on. As if that was not enough, fracking is a leading cause of earthquakes. And as part of the reason it has been banned in many parts of Europe, the UK put a moratorium on fracking a year or two ago because the earthquakes that it was causing every time that they tried to reactivate it were massive. And the top graphs are from the US, the Eastern states of the US, I believe it's Oklahoma, some of it. And um, as you can see, since the inception of fracking, the magnitude and frequency of earthquakes has grow, gone up exponentially. Imagine in a place like Mendoza, where I come from, which is naturally desertic and naturally seismic. This is a time bomb, not only for Mendoza, but for everywhere that fracking is, is being uh, implemented. Then this is a relatively old, but the most recent one that you can find online, map of the status of fracking in Europe. Uh, it should be updated with Spain and the UK turn red as they have both committed to a, a ban or moratorium on fracking. But while most of these Western European governments don't allow fracking in their own territories, it is the multinational flagship companies from these governments, from these countries that are leading the destruction of our countries in the global south, Shell from the Netherlands, now England, BP from England, Total from France, Wintersal from Germany, Repsol from Spain, and so on. OMV from Austria, which is not fracking, but making lots of plastics from it. Um, Any from Italy, and so on. Equinor from Norway, a state-owned multinational climate criminal. And then this is the hypocrisy of Europe. Uh, and the Greens are a big part of this, I am afraid to say. The Greens, as I will show you later, have played a major negative role in helping this advance and helping the LNG and the fried gas come to Europe and be subsidized by the European governments while they have banned it in Europe. So what Europe is doing is it's outsourcing it. It's outsourcing its emissions to the rest of the world. And then they import the, the gas. And since here it burns cleaner than coal because they don't take into account the life cycle production upstream and downstream and so on. Then they say, well, it, it produces less CO2 than coal. Yeah, of course, because it's made up of methane but they don't show the entire supply chain. And this is part of the trick, is part of the problem. And that's why we need to look at this in a holistic global way, which is part of the problem that we are in the climate crisis because we're all in these national bubbles where we only look at things where it matters to us, but not where it's coming from and where things are going afterwards. Now, is this a cognitive dissonance? Recently, one of the latest, I think is the latest IPCC report, uh, was calling out for drastic methane cuts. So everyone now agrees and methane is becoming a common, a mainstream topic for the conversation that was not like that before. And the US and the EU have championed and pulled many other countries into this global methane pledge, which was announced at COP. This global methane pledge is pledging to reduce methane emissions by 30% by the end of this decade. Well, look at the other side of the graph. One of the biggest sponsors of COP was the biggest importer of frac gas of the UK and a leading methane emitter around the world, which a few days before COP on the 23rd of October, this article was published with this major scandal where national grid uh, um, infrastructure across the UK was shown to be leaking enormous amounts of methane everywhere. 
not only that, National Grid is a multinational company also present in the US where our comrades are fighting it it's got frac gas pipelines. They're trying to build an LNG export terminal in Brooklyn and a frac gas pipeline in a disadvantaged neighborhoods of color. And so people are fighting this everywhere. And yet COP is sponsored by them. So I really want to shine light here because we um, scientists are usually blamed of being naive, politically naive, or believing in institutions and governments. And something that the struggle has taught me is that these governments and institutions are nothing more than a front for the interest of the multinational corporations that are really the power behind the throne, that are really the ones that are writing these agreements, these commitments, and lobbying them into the legislatures to be published, to be promoted by governments. And it's unless we, the people, the grassroots, build power on the streets, to counterbalance this, politicians will always, by default, fall for these uh, powers behind the throne. So keep this in mind, because this is extremely serious, and it's really serious that very few people in the climate movement even knew about it. Furthermore, of course, you know that the fossil fuel industry had by far the largest delegation uh, of, of delegates in, the, in, in COP, another way of showing how much greenwashing, how much a farce all of this is. And I would like to ask everyone who reads the IPCC report, everyone who went to COP, everyone who's looking at all of this, please look, go to the website of Shell, go to the website of Total, go to the website of BP. They are telling you on your face. They're telling you on our faces that they are going in the exact opposite direction from the methane pledge, for the commitments, from everything else. In front of all of our eyes, the fossil fuel frontier is expanding. And it's expanding, especially in the global south, where communities are fighting. And I want to make a plea here, because we need to put ourselves at the service of those communities. And that's where we could have the greatest impact in reducing and, and slowing the climate crisis and getting victories. But look at this. All of them are betting really heavily on LNG, and all of them have the same discourse that this is part of a clean future, when it's the exact opposite. As if all of this was not enough, and I promise I have positive things to share at the end, uh, but fracking is a major reason for the global plastic boom. Have you not wondered, like in Europe, it's just insane. They don't give you plastic bags here anymore, but everything else is plastic. It's just insane the amounts of plastic that everyone consumes and, and wastes every week. And one reason is why aren't they really willing to really touch plastic when the oceans are drowning in it and everyone is warning us? Well, look, the fracking revolution has also revolutionized the amounts of available ethane. Ethane is the raw material for a lot of the plastics production. And the plastics industry is deeply connected to the, to the fracking and the oil industry. Not only are they not reducing production of plastics, it's growing exponentially. And it's growing exponentially thanks to the availability of cheap ethane made possible by the shale revolution. You can see in a couple of articles that I have put the references here, the US is in fact expanding 264 petrochemical plants, increasing plastics production by 30%. This is what's happening while we talk about 1.5, while we drown in how much 1.5, 1.8. This is the real, you know, this is how the climate crisis gets real. It gets a name, it gets a face. It's something we can fight if we all come together and think of a strategy. More, even more, the, the shale revolution has also helped a lot the fertilizer industry. The amount of ammonia produced from shale gas has grown a lot. And Yara, for example, the biggest fertilizer producer in Europe, which has a plant here in Germany or more than one plant, and is also building this next to LNG terminals so that they can feed on it to produce this fertilizer. So the very fertilizers that are fueling a monoculture culture of the world, you know, a, a depleting system for the soils of the planet is also deeply connected to the shale industry. <clears throat> and what's the IPCC doing? What's COP doing? Well, we know what COP is doing. COP is sponsored by them. You'll not find a single word about this in COP, of course. 
And will you find anything about this in the IPCC reports? Well, search for it. Look, I tried. Uh, no results for fracking or hydraulic fracturing, but I was able to find. I was able to find an older report. I believe it was 2012, but my my memory is not very good right now. Uh, where you can actually see that they were actually praising it. They're not only, not only not touching the topic, not condemning this hugely powerful topic that is revolutionizing the energy matrix of the world in the years to come, but in fact, they were praising it as, look at this, that the, 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 um, the deployment of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling has increased and diversified gas supply to allow for a more extensive switching of power and heat production from coal to gas, just like we're hearing in Europe. And that this is an important reason for a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in the US. If this is not the IPCC lending itself to greenwash, one of the worst techniques and, and, and projections of energy in the future, I don't know what it is. So don't believe anyone and really do let's do our own research and tackle these problems that they're not talking about and uh, there's a reason most people in europe when i made these presentations for the first time they had never heard about much of this and then as if this was not enough um the new german government has a lot of power in the eu of course and it has the greens have switched their position and now they have made a deal for germany to be pro-gas to, the, to, to label gas a green investment. This will have enormous consequences as billions and billions of euros of public funds, subsidies and loans will be given to the gas developments going forward when the opposite should happen. And France and, and Germany have made a deal whereby France will support gas and Germany also supports nuclear because France is big on nuclear. So they're both going ahead with this uh, gas and nuclear deal. So more to add to the insult to injury to the climate fight. Now, to give you a brief picture from the global south, the place I come from is not a small problem. It's not a problem just for us. It's a problem for everyone, for everyone of you in Europe as well. The Vaca Muerta Basin is a huge carbon bomb for the planet. And it's been shown that Argentina's shale reserves, when fully exploited, will consume 15%. And I'm sure it's an underestimate. 15% of the entire global carbon budget, just one country. Now, who is fracking us? I will show you in a minute who is fracking us, mostly global north multinational companies. Now, this is what is more important than the numbers and the statistics, because the more we talk about statistics and number, the more disconnected we get from the people and, the, and to mobilize the people also, and the people who are suffering at the front lines. In Argentina, in the front lines, in the rural countryside, no one talks about 1.5 or the IPCC. Few people even know what that is, but they're fighting for their water. They're fighting to save their land from fracking and mining, from fossil fuel companies and mining companies from Canada, from Europe. And so in Argentina, in our area, the Mapuche people are suffering the highest consequences. This is a native nation <clears throat> whose land pretty much coincides with the limits of Vaca Muerta. So this is some articles that really encourage you to read, to see the real cost, the real impact of gas and fracking in, on people. And this is a map showing the biggest landholders, uh, fossil fuel companies that are fracking in Argentina and Vaca Muerta. And as you can see, you got Pan American Energy, which is owned by BP, Total, uh, ExxonMobil from the US, Shell from now is a British company moved to England, Chevron from the, from the US, Wintersal from Germany, which to give you an idea, when I arrived in Germany almost three years ago, I started sounding the alarm about Wintersal is the biggest oil and gas company of Germany. Nobody knew of it. Even the climate movement was shocked to learn about it. So to me, it tells me as, as someone from the global south, what is the climate movement doing in Europe that doesn't even know the name of its own biggest climate criminals that are destroying the planet while it's talking about 1.5 and the IPCC? There's also a cognitive dissonance there. There's somewhat, something that we need to reconnect because this is the climate crisis and it's happening today. This is also from the US Energy Agency, just to show it's from 2019, so it's outdated, but showing that thanks to fracking, Argentina's LNG exports were beginning. Now there's a geopolitical side and just 
uh, mind you, I have really shortened my presentation because it's impossible to cover all these issues in such a short time. But I want to give you a big picture and I will fly over some of this. But this is another huge insanity. Donald Trump went a step, a step farther than Obama, who is the one who introduced fracking and made it a policy for the US to become energy independent. Trump went a step farther and called for American energy dominance, a clear, a clear statement of American imperialism on the, in the world and to conquer the world, to dominate the world, this time with LNG. So in that sense, fracking and LNG are nothing less than the energy dominance strategy of the US. And this is not an anti-US presentation. I have just as much bad things to say about Russia and other countries, uh, but the US is the largest contributor historically to the climate crisis. And it, we should not look away when they're telling us what they're doing. But look, when Biden took office, he didn't change anything about fracking. In fact, fracking was a big part of the debate with, uh, between the two of them. And, and he clearly said, Biden said, I'm not going to ban fracking. And far from that, while this American energy dominance policy continues in the US, and mind you, these are both whitehouse.gov uh, screenshots. The links will be below the, the slides. The new publication more recently is the, the announcement of the Global Methane Pledge. So can you tell me, how can a Global Methane Pledge coexist with American energy dominance policies? It's inexplicable. And below you have some right-wing media outlet as uh, this is a methane publication about how uh, Trump's deregulation of the methane rules which were necessary to expand the fracking industry, they sell it as something that will actually protect the air and advance American energy dominance. Again, all the links are beneath each slide. And I know these topics ex escape most scientists because we are all specialized. I'm a biologist, many might be maybe physicists or, or, or social scientists, but this, this grows across the fields. And that's why we need to also come out of this hyper-specialization paradigm, technocratic paradigm that is blinding us to look at the full picture behind the problems of the world. Because nothing, the climate crisis is the best example. Nothing is a better example than that, that we need to look at things holistically and connect the dots. This is just some of the greenwashing official government websites from Germany and beyond about LNG as, an, as a leading, leading the transition. Um, Trump did not get his way easily. He had to use force, he had to use threats. And this is not my word, but the Wall Street Journal, and you can find it in Forbes and many international renowned publications, Reuters, how Trump actually used threats and coercion to get Europe to build these LNG terminals by threatening, in the case of Germany, to impose tariffs on the car industry of, of Germany so that the industry would move to uh, the UK after Brexit. Then Merkel had to give in and, uh, and start building LNG terminals in Germany. A similar story has happened in many other countries. Now, a lot of this is sold, and it was sold before the conflict with Russia, as if giving, it, giving Europe independent from Russian gas. I think the, the gas crisis that is happening now, first and foremost, what needs to be said is that it's due to the failure of Europe to invest into renewable sources of energy and into a truly just transition enough in a scale large enough, and that it will not give independence from Russia Russia is playing a two-pronged strategy, as you can read from this lobby magazine for natural gas. Russia has Gazprom, which is a state-owned company, and also has Novatech, which is a privately owned multi uh, company that is owned by many front men for Putin and Russian oligarchs. Their company is making a killing from the LNG deals and is shipping record volumes to Europe, as you can see in the Reuters news down there. It's also been involved in building LNG terminals in Germany and in Europe. So it's false to say that this is one or the other. Russia is also profiting from that. And in the end, Russian gas will always be cheaper than the American shale gas that also has to be additionally transported across the ocean. Now, this is the most insane slide of all. 
the American Energy Secretary back then, Rick Perry, <clears throat> who was from used to be the governor of Texas, the birthplace of fracking, actually he and Trump labeled frac gas freedom gas. And as you can see in the red rectangle, they have gone as far as to say this. 75 years after liberating Europe from Nazi Germany occupation, the US is again delivering a form of freedom to the European continent. This is what they're doing in all of our faces. And are we as scientists, as grassroots, as NGOs going to do nothing about this? The financial side is also deplorable. There's many uh, studies. This is an, an opinion piece from the New York Times from before the pandemic and already was announcing that the next financial crisis may be tied to the fracking bubble. So I'm not going to go deeper into this right now, but it's been fueled by years of, of free money, easy credits. As the rates will go up, this debt becomes unpayable. And so I encourage you to read on this because it's also, it may drag down the world with it. And they're financing it with a money printing machine at the expense of, the, of people and the planet. Now, this is one of the most important parts for me to say to all scientists that we believe in the IPCC, we believe in science, we believe in the institutions of science, we believe in universities. But I must tell you, universities in my country, even the most renowned, lent themselves to, themselves to help fracking advance. They made fake reports. They made reports that were designed for the fracking industry to prove that they were clean. So don't believe any institutions and look at the power behind the throne. There is an elephant in the room and that's corporate power. The governments are not going to deal with them. They are working for them. It is up to us from the grassroots to build the necessary power to counter this and demand concrete targets, concrete demands to have the governments achieve them for us. But it will not happen while we just are outside of this room chanting to fight for 1.5. Now, this is a quote from a, a singer and a labor organizer, Yuta Phillips. The earth is not dying, it's being killed. And the people who are killing it have names and addresses. And this is something that we all need to realize to tackle directly who are making the climate crisis happen. This is a, a quick cartoon that I could find. You know, this is the situation right now and we need to balance this scale to people. And how do we do that? By achieving millions to mobilize on the streets, but to mobilize with clear targets. And 1.5 is not a target. It's, it's a, of course, we all agree with that, but you know, a clean target is get Shell out of Acamorta or the Tar Sands or uh, Recon Africa out of Namibia. You know, something clear and concrete, we can achieve that. Get Repsol out of Peru, get Repsol to pay for the spill. These are very obvious things. And it's something that if we come together strategically, we can achieve. We need to break down the climate crisis one case at a time, one milestone at a time and, and tackle that strategically. And I think as scientists, we need to shift Besides our specialties, we have a challenge here. And as intellectuals, as academics, we should really research and think about creating a think tank, a, a climate action think tank that could scan the problems around the world and find where we could be strategically stronger. So this is a question more of the sciences of strategy and things like that, even more than many of the natural sciences that we have so much about, even too much about. We're focusing too much on the statistics and we're going nowhere. <clears throat> now look at this, 100 companies responsible for 71% of global emissions. So forget about the state nation governments, just look at the companies and they move across borders. They are, they're global. And what if we start to tackle them? What if we start to show the real actors of the climate crisis and start bringing down their operations one case at a time. We can do that if we come together. And we have to start by the global south, guys. Look at this. This is the relative weight in emissions of the global north companies and global south. And as you can see, the disproportionate weight of global north corporations, which the global north is responsible for the largest historic emissions and contributions to the climate crisis. As the frontier of fossil fuels and mining is expanding, 
it's expanding into communities of frontline communities around the world. Those communities are crying out for help and we can connect with them and we can help a lot by bringing those stories to the visibility in Europe and the global north where the centers of power are. Now, some of this I'll go very quickly over. This is just to show you that these are not just good people that are making mistakes, that we could say, well, they just maybe they don't know. No. You know, these people have, they're murdering people. This is, there is a deliberate decision by these fossil fuel companies to wage war on life, to wage war on the planet, to keep their profits to the ultimate consequences, to the last minute, to expand them for as long as they can at the expense of everyone else. And they're willing to go to extreme lengths for that. One of them is murdering people like Shell did in, in, uh, with the Ogoni people in Nigeria. So I encourage you to read this. Uh, Yamal LNG to, uh, Total in Russia and in, uh, in Mozambique here, in Russia in current, um, encroaching in the native lands of people in Mozambique, militarizing and bringing violence and division, sectarian violence, to Mozambique, the, they so call it the curse of natural gas. This is so with these companies behind the scenes. Then they are, nobody can question that these companies are extremely corrupt. And I just put here some links of the few cases that make it to the headlines. This is the tip of the iceberg. They are rampantly corrupt and they will go to any extent, especially in the global south where corruption is paramount, they can easily lobby their way and buy politicians to do anything they want. So that's why we need to mobilize against them. Waging war on the planet. They have known for half a century the consequences of their actions on the climate and on people like this uh, Total and Exxon examples. And what they, have they done? Not only have they done nothing to stop this, but they have fueled disinformation and financed fake science to question the original science. So we also need to, as scientists, we need to denounce, we need to confront the scientists that are making this possible, the scientists that are lending themselves, because these companies are only able to make all of this greenwashing with great scientists that are putting together these beautiful packages to greenwash, to sell to COP, to sell to the governments, to undermine the truth. So if they get away with this with no consequences, they will continue to do it. But if we can start exposing the scientists that have helped this, it would be a great step. And I think scientists' rebellion could have a great role in doing so. Now look at this, they're also undermining democracy. And I'm afraid that, as you can see, they were connected to the people behind the attempting coup in, in the, the US. They are behind many white supremacist groups. And I, what I'm really worried is that as the climate crisis grows and awareness grows about these companies and their roles, it will be easier for them to help break down society, especially in Europe, where you have all these racist groups and fascism on the rise because it's not easy to do climate activism in a society that is breaking down. You know, XR and Fridays, they were born in relative stability in Europe. Uh, but if you have a societies that are breaking down into civil wars, the chaos will be such and the financial chaos will be such that these companies will get away with doing whatever they want because nobody will be able to gather enough consensus to stop them. So it's not casual that they are behind funding. And by the way, this is from Greenpeace, okay? This is not a conspiracy theory. You can read this one from the left. I believe the left one is from, from Greenpeace website. <clears throat> then there's a revolving door. I think everyone knows about this and they go back and forth between the big industry and, and the key positions at the EU parliament or the governments in the EU. Their conflicts of interest are everywhere. And then to give you an idea, to put it into context, you expect governments in the global south to be able to put any resistance to this, not only because many governments are corrupt. And if you had a Che Guevara elected government that wants to fight these companies, he will be overthrown in no time, as is already happening to some, as has already happened before. So, but look at the relative weight of these companies. The, the earnings, the revenues from some of these are bigger than the entire GDP of entire nations. So to expect that from those nations, there will come regulation, it's impossible. Just look at this one. I also quickly put it together, <clears throat> comparing the GDPs 
of entire nations in Africa and uh, Latin America. And most of these oil companies are bigger than most of these countries. So they run the countries as if they were their own property. And here we go, the global south is at the front lines and especially Latin America where the defense of the Amazon and the forest and the natural resources are so huge as well. 75% of all murdered environmental defenders came from were in Latin America from this period from 2002 to 2017. The human rights violations and the, the killing of defenders, my exile is just one small example. There's people that have it much worse and they're fighting your companies from Europe and they're fighting, this is the climate fight. We need to connect with them. We need to help amplify their struggles in Europe because if, if killing an activist in Brazil or Colombia would become a scandal in Europe, in the home country of the companies, it would, mean, it would be a lot more politically costly for those governments and companies to have those people killed. So the power is here, but the causes, the urgent struggles are there, and we need to connect on this global fight. Now, very briefly, because I'm really running over time, <clears throat> I really need to warn you about the hydrogen hype. I hope at a different time, you guys can maybe hold a webinar about this, invite hydrogen and methane experts to further discuss this. But basically the lobby for gas has invested billions of euros in the last few years to build this story that hydrogen, that gas is necessary to build a bridge toward renewable energies in which hydrogen is an, is an essential part of that equation. The problem is that hydrogen is a majority produced from fossil fuels. So now it's only less than 1% has been produced from renewable sources in the world at, until now. And producing it at the large, necessary large scale is impossible with the available techniques. And this hydrogen hype implies the using of really unproven or proven wrong techniques such as carbon capture and storage and many other uh, greenwashing uh, or uh, fake solutions that are aimed at expanding the lifespan of the fossil fuel industry by expanding the lifespan of gas. Another promise that, yeah, we will use less and less gas going forward. Most hydrogen is blue hydrogen, is gray hydrogen, it's produced from gas to produce the hydrogen, but it's actually more contaminating than using the gas or the, or the coal in the first place. So um, this is also all about that, and you, you can all read more about that later. But finally, and quickly, hope. You know, this is what I was saying. We're all screaming outside the window, tell the truth, 501.5, and this is the corporations happily milking and destroying the planet for the last drop of oil and gas and profits. Now, I really love Shell Must Fall, and I think it's a blueprint from, for system change. I, also, I was the one who wrote some of this article for them as a proposal, because I think it's a way where people can take power into their own hands and build resistance against the biggest symbol of the system. Everyone talks about system change, about bringing down capitalism. Yeah, how? How do you mean to do this? And one way that I can see that we can help change the system is by tackling the worst symbols of that system, the worst climate criminals that are undeniably bad, undeniably doing climate crimes around the world with total impunity, with the impunity of COP, IPCC, the governments are not the UN, they're not talking about them, we must. So uh, also along the way, we have made global actions. And also this was early on when I arrived in Europe, the first victory against LNG, we blocked the port of Gothenburg in Sweden for a whole day. And this led also with a lot of prior work from the Swedish activists to the government denying the permit for the LNG terminal. So there is hope, there is hope in Ireland as well, even though the Green Party has betrayed them now, but I was there helping that action. I, we glued the science to the Department of the Environment with XR. And then I was able to meet with Pope Francis and get his support because I believe in this. It doesn't matter. We need to, to use all the tools available. Uh, you know, you could say, people could say Extinction Rebellion is too radical. People could say the Pope is too conservative. Yeah, but we need, this is a survival struggle. This is not a picky struggle where we say, well, I'm not going to get the support of the Pope because he's not a progressive. But um, the support was important for the struggle in Ireland. And soon after that, the Irish newly formed government, which was a coalition with the Greens, 
actually committed to banning the import of frack gas and to take away the two LNG plant terminals, which were some of the biggest in Europe, out of the plants. However, and the link to the program is below this slide, and I think it could be a great blueprint for other countries, because there's, this is a government that already acknowledged how bad frack gas is. And, and gas altogether. So that is a really important document. But during the pandemic, they saw that the movements were becoming weaker and this coalition government has actually stepped back, backtracked and say, no, just kidding. We're going to move forward with the LNG and frac gas imports. Obviously the people in Ireland are going to keep fighting, but um, I wanted to share this with you. Then this is a map from the Environmental Justice Atlas that has tried to map some, some of the frontline struggles and connections around the world. By far, it's not complete, but this could be a good tool for people who would be interested in finding connections and finding struggles that need support on, also in Europe, but also in Africa, in Latin America, in, in Asia. And then this is a map that people made in our coalition that we built, Shale Must Fall, <clears throat> showing the connections of the extraction of gas and fracking between the world, the fossil fuel companies involved, showing how global and, and multi-pronged and, and just um, wholesome we need to look at this. We cannot just look at this from the emissions in Germany or the emissions in England or the emissions in Spain. Then almost finished, and um, we built this global grassroots coalition as a play on words with Shell Must Fall and with them, and we call it Shale Must Fall. And we have been doing massive actions connecting 20 countries, thousands of people mobilizing, especially in Argentina, lately in Germany with Ende Gelende. We were thousands blocking these LNG sites, and we need to keep, keep growing with that. I myself have been arrest, arrested a couple of times already. We blocked a, a major canal, the busiest in the world with kayaks uh, in Germany for this. And we are continuing to grow and we continue to grow grassroots power because coming together, I believe is the only way we can stop this. And the last slide more recently, just a couple of weeks ago, this is why I was running quite crazy while they contacted me for this presentation, but uh, we put together in no time in two or three weeks, a global action that mobilized nearly 20 countries, thousands of people in Peru, in Argentina, uh, and all over the world, in many countries of Africa, against the offshore drilling and the oil spills. And we were able to do this because we were flexible from the bottom up with the grassroots and the global south driven impulse as there was this major oil spill in Peru from Repsol and Repsol doesn't want to pay and it's a Spanish company. And there was a major development in Argentina as Equinor from Norway and Shell are planning to do seismic surveys and offshore drilling there. So we just connected all the struggles and South Africa, which recently managed to get Hell, Shell out of there. And then we were able to really come together in a really powerful way that is really going to keep growing. And everyone here is invited to join us. The next action we will do is for World Water Day because water has been commodified by Wall Street and it's actually trading on Wall Street like a commodity since December of 2020. Nobody's doing much about this. And the UN declared water a human right 10 years ago, a decade or more ago, and now has nothing to say about it, about the water trading in Wall Street. So we need to raise awareness, awareness in Europe, in the global north. We need to tackle the companies that are the leading polluters of water, which are the same, the fracking and mining companies, mainly from the global north. And that's all. And I don't know if we have time for a one minute video to show you an action of shale must fall. Please tell me, Francisca. Well, we have about five minutes for questions, so I don't okay. know if we want to use a minute for the video. I'm sorry. I'll just share the link here. For yeah, share the link because the video is really cool and people should watch it. Esteban, thank you so much for this presentation. I love the idea of, of tackling specific groups and people to to make this transition, not by just asking for the transition and big uh, big concept changes, but actually tackling the ones who are keeping the system in, in check right now. Please put your questions in the chat. We have uh, time for about one or two questions, so be quick. Put your question in so we can ask it to Esteban.
Um, Gami, you got a question? Uh, th thank you for the, for the awesome presentation, uh, Esteban. So uh, I, I was trying to, uh, to, uh, to bring a question to you uh, in, in the term of an uh, Sub-Saharan African context with this subject matter, speaking of the Global South countries and the way bigger projects are now happening in, in Africa, speaking of Tanzania, I'm from Tanzania, we're just having a mega East Africa. I've been hearing a lot about that. And um, we, we are actually on the, uh, I can say on, on, on a dilemma because at the same time, they're claiming to have environmental assessments that can actually be made as well, of course, because if it's the government doing that, but at the same time, uh, the age of the activists, um, what, is, what, what is the proper way to, uh, to see on how we can address the subject matter, acknowledging that this is actually happening and the project will actually be implemented? You were breaking up for me a little. What is the exact question? If we should go against this because people see it as a develop as a positive development? Oh, uh, what, what can you do as activists uh, acknowledging that this project will actually be happening? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I can only answer you as a fellow Global South uh, activist. And my understanding from the experience from the last few years in Europe also is that uh, we isolated, you know, you, uh, me in Argentina, people around the world, front lines, in isolation, we will not be able to defeat this multinational threat. It's impossible to stop fracking or mining or the air corp pipeline. In isolation, we are weaker and smaller and we have no power in, in Africa or Latin America. Nobody talks about it. The Global North never finds out when you kill, you're killed or whatever. So my answer to this is let's put the Global North movements at the service of your struggles, at the service of our struggles. Let's, let's pitch to them because more and more the European movements are gaining awareness of colonialism, they want to be anti-colonial, and we can show the connection of this also directly to their own survival, because it's not just out of solidarity with Africa or Latin America, but for your own survival, because it has a huge climate impact. And one thing I wanted to add is, you know, as Scientist Rebellion, I believe it's a great tool for inviting a lot of new people into the action, into action, into activism, scientists that were not activists before. And if you ask me, where can we as scientists have the greatest impact? I would say, don't get so lost about the IPCC and the latest numbers. It's important to tackle them. But I think the greatest power is when this global movement can put itself at the service of the front lines. Everywhere where the frontier is happening, like you were saying, Gamit, or in Argentina or in Brazil or in Colombia, whatever, all of this is coming accompanied by a greenwashing package that this will create jobs, that this will create development, that so to get people on their side. But this greenwashing is usually very easy to break down with science. And that's where a global scientific movement can have so much power, because if you can expose the lies of the local governments from the global uh, platforms that you have, and actually tackle the companies internationally, like in Namibia, they are trying to do fracking in the Okavango, and the company is giving people free water and making water wells for the people. So it's like, oh, this Recon Africa is great, it's giving us water. But you know, we can easily break down this narrative and that's a role that Scientist Rebellion, I believe could be very powerful by going down to the grassroots, going to the front lines. Very cool. Um, Esteban, I think we're gonna take one more question and I wanna put two of the questions we have together. One question was about do we actually need degrowth for less energy use in order to get away from fossil fuels? And the other question was um, that a lot of um, a lot of the narrative about gas is that we cannot build renewable energies fast enough. So I guess it's it's kind of the same question: like, can we build renewable energies fast enough to stay with where we are, or do we have to actually decrease our use as well? And what should we ask for? Well, I think both the level of consumption in Europe and North America is obscene. I lived in the US for 10 years. 
man, the amounts of garbage, the amounts of consumption, like uh, I think a hundred people from the global, any global South countries together consume less than one single person in Europe or in the US. So it's a generalization, of course, it, it varies, but definitely we need less consumption. Now, I think it, how easy is that to happen? Well, not as long as you have the regulatory capture and the states being captured by the companies that's why I'm saying that, you know, the lobby for gas has invested more than 50 million euros per year in the last few years to lobby, just to lobby Brussels to put the hydrogen hype It's in the links that I have shared. So it's not going to happen by itself. And if these governments wanted, if there was, if it was really being treated as an emergency, we could have an explosion in renewable energies. Uh, you know, I think it's like a hundred square kilometers of solar panels could supply, I believe, nearly the entirety of the global energy demands. So it's definitely doable. If they're not doing it, it's because in a big part, they are captured by the companies that want to perpetrate their profits. Cool. Um, there's some more questions for you in the chat. So maybe you can answer them in the chat. And I want to give the microphone to Bilbo now, who's going to tell you all a bit more about our organization, Scientist Rebellion, and why you should join us. Thank you very much, Francisca. Uh, I'm going to do it in Spanish, uh, not because I don't, I can't do it in in English, but because <laughs> we are going to try to decolonize a little bit this space. <laughs> so I assume that the translator are already aware and they are ready to translate it. Así que voy a comenzar en castellano. <laughs> Eh, me llamo Eduardo Rovira, soy abogado, no soy científico eh, y soy del sur de España, concretamente de Andalucía, que es una región además que se ve especialmente arrasada por la sequía. Un tercio era un desierto en 2019 y la cosa no ha ido mejor, con lo cual podéis imaginar que ya más de un tercio es un desierto y este año volvemos a afrontar otra sequía. Entonces, el problema precisamente no del agua es un problema obviamente global. ¿no? En el, no podemos, no podemos decir que en el norte global nos vayamos a, li, a librar. Eh, ¿Qué es Scientist Rebellion y por qué deberíamos todas unirnos, incluso aunque no seamos científicas, porque hay muchas otras formas de colaborar, no solamente ponerse en primera línea, ¿no? sino también dar ese apoyo eh, alrededor de, del movimiento en sí, que podemos hacer las personas que no seamos científicas. Porque recordemos que para las acciones sí que tienen que ser científicas, pero para todo lo que las rodea no es necesario. Para grabar puede grabar cualquiera. Eh, bueno, pues la, la teoría por la que maneja Scientist Rebellion es que tenemos que, cre que ir creando otros puntos de no retorno. ¿no? Igual que pasa con el clima, tenemos que hacerlo con la sociedad y tenemos que movilizar a la sociedad para que suceda alguna, co alguna cosa que implique que otras cosas vayan sucediendo. En el caso de Scientist Rebellion, obviamente, es la, moviliz la movilización de científicas. ¿Por qué la movilización de científicas? Bueno, pues porque se consideran que, o consideramos, que eh, aquellos que entienden mejor o que están más capacitados para entender las consecuencias de la crisis climática tienen también una responsabilidad especial en actuar para afrontarla. Eh, hay una estrategia sobre todo esto, que es la de, primero, actuar como si estuviésemos en una crisis. No tiene sentido que la científica nos esté diciendo al resto de la humanidad continuamente que estamos en una crisis, que estamos en una emergencia climática, pero que no veamos ningún tipo de actitud por vuestra parte como si estuviésemos efectivamente en una crisis climática. Es la típica metáfora de si tu casa está en llamas y yo te digo, oye, que se quema la casa, pero luego sigo tomándome el café tranquilamente, tú no haces nada. En cambio, si yo te digo, oye, que se quema la casa, rompo una ventana y salgo corriendo de la vivienda, entonces probablemente tú hagas lo mismo. Eh, todo esto se compone de una estrategia que es la de la desobediencia civil, la de la acción directa no violenta, que es la de ganar credibilidad a través del sacrificio, del sacrificio personal. Yo me expongo, dejo a un lado todos los privilegios que tengo y me los juego por de alguna manera para afrontar un, una problemática que necesita de una acción radical. En ese sentido, tenemos algunos ejemplos históricos, como la sufragés ¿no? en, en, en Reino Unido, el movimiento feminista cuando luchaba por el voto, el ejemplo de Martin Luther King y de tantísimos otros grandes referentes de la desobediencia civil no violenta. 
y al final todo esto nos vuelve a llevar a lo mismo, ¿no? es a actuar como si estuviésemos en una emergencia. Si alguien tiene una idea mejor sobre cómo conseguir escapar de la crisis climática, que por favor la escriba en el chat ahora, porque realmente lo único que puede ahora mismo causar un impacto suficiente como para acabar con la problemática de la crisis climática y que seamos realmente capaces de afrontarla, es la desobediencia civil no violenta. Con respecto a Scientist Rebellion, un poco de historia de Scientist Rebellion, aunque para eso también podéis consultar en la charla anterior si no lo visto. Eh, que lo tendréis de primera mano ¿no? eh, que fue Michael que dio todo el, esta, esta parte de la, de la llamada a la acción eh, pero Scientist Rebellion comienza en septiembre de 2020 con una pequeña, entre comillas, acción en la que se, se tiró pintura a la Royal Society porque ellos no apoyaban la desobediencia civil eh, como una forma de combatir la crisis climática eso a ojos de la gente que participó en la acción y que fundó este movimiento, es poco menos que negar eh, o que de no decir la verdad al respecto de la crisis climática. ¿Por qué? Pues porque efectivamente la desobediencia civil se ha demostrado históricamente como un método suficientemente útil para afrontar este tipo de circunstancias, para generar un cambio necesario y que una institución como la Royal Society la menosprecie, quiere decir que está menospreciando las posibles soluciones a la crisis climática. En marzo de 2021, eh, Scientist Rebellion se vuelve una, un movimiento internacional y se pr produce una acción en 10 países distintos. En agosto de 2021 se filtra el informe del IPCC, que, que saldrá además, por cierto, pronto, en abril. Eh, y en octubre de ese mismo año se produce una acción masiva en la que 20 científicas tiran pintura y pegan papers en el Ministerio de Transición Ecológica en España, concretamente en Madrid, en el marco de la Semana de Rebelión de Extinction Rebellion en España. Eh, ya por, por último, durante la COP26 se produce también por parte de este grupo el primer arresto masivo de científicas en relación con la crisis climática eh, porque estuvimos, estuvimos <ríe> bloqueando el puente eh, del rey, rey George, King, King George V <ríe> eh, durante seis horas. Eh, a posteriori eh, hemos tenido también algunas acciones más pequeñas. Al, al mismo día, al, en la misma semana de la COP se dieron una serie de teachings sobre por qué se había estado produciendo la, la acción, se hizo también otra acción en la sede de, de Scottish Power, que si no me equivoco es Iberdrola, allí en, en Escocia. Eh, también recientemente, ¿no? este mismo día 14, hemos visto que por el día de San Valentín nuestros compañeros Mike y Elena han hecho una fantástica acción en la sede de, de Total en París. En fin, que nos estamos moviendo. <risa> eh, y como nos estamos moviendo, pues tenemos un plan para sobre cómo movernos. ¿no? El plan la podéis encontrar en nuestra web, en scientirebellion.com, y es una movilización de cara a la semana del 4 de abril. ¿Por qué la semana del 4 de abril? Pues porque el 4 de abril es cuando se supone que se va a publicar el informe del IPCC que ya filtramos nosotras en agosto del año pasado. Pero claro, esperamos que esté pues, notoriamente modificado porque las últimas versiones tienden a suavizarse bastante por las presiones tanto de los gobiernos como de las compañías. Eh, ¿Qué vamos a hacer para afrontar esto? Bueno, pues eh, para esto tenemos varias campañas. De un lado tenemos una campaña de huelgas y ocupaciones a comenzar esa misma semana en las universidades. Al mismo tiempo, el, para el día 6, que es el miércoles, eh, eh, vamos a pedir a la gente, a las científicas, que actúen como si fuese una emergencia. <ríe> es decir, que asuman un gran riesgo, que se, se involucren en acciones de, directas, no violentas, que desafíen de verdad el paradigma que nos con el que nos encontramos y estamos, tenemos un cálculo estimado ahora mismo de unas 250 científicas. Para el día 8 y 9, que serían el viernes y el sábado, vamos a tener también... Eh, acciones de, de presión más baja en el que estimamos la participación de unas 750 científicas con acciones de tipo eh, pues pegada de carteles, eh, cortar carreteras y todo este tipo de cosas. ¿vale? Eh, ahora mismo tenemos presencia en muchísimos países, eh, en el, todo, por toda Europa prácticamente, prácticamente también por la mayor parte de países de África, India, Asia, en muchísimos países de Latinoamérica y tenemos... Mmm, Planes de incluso ir ampliando aún más. 
me están pidiendo que vaya cortando, lo siento, es que tiendo a enrollarme muchísimo. Entonces, bueno, por ahí intentando abreviar un poco, ya termino. Eh, el objetivo último de Scientist Rebellion es ni más ni menos que la revolución climática. Necesitamos una revolución climática. ¿Por qué? Pues porque sabemos que la gente que está en el poder son los, aquellos que nos han metido en esta situación. Y para, sobre, para resolver esta situación no nos queda más remedio que quitar a esta gente del poder. ¿Cómo podemos hacer esto? Bueno, pues nuestro método es la de soberanía civil no violenta y es que incluso el IPCC reconoce que no se puede conseguir la salvación de la, frente a la crisis climática de la raza humana si no cambiamos el sistema en el que nos movemos. El, la estrategia para esto sería normalizar la desobediencia civil de la comunidad científica y, eh, aquello, y yo sé que es duro para muchas científicas hacer esto, pero es que aquellas personas que tienen el, una situación de privilegio tienen también el deber de actuar para afrontar esta tremendísima situación en la que nos encontramos, ¿no? especialmente si estamos en el norte global, porque ya sabemos que tenemos la grandísima suerte de que yo puedo ir mañana a protestar a una calle y como mucho me detienen, si lo hago en Colombia, igual me pegan un tiro. Entonces... Es obvio que tenemos una gran capacidad de actuar frente a la que nos encontramos en otros territorios. Y ya para terminar, voy a, voy a compartir con vosotras una cita que a mí me motiva muchísimo y que creo que podemos aplicarnos un poco. ¿no? Es de Buenaventura Durruti, que es un revolucionario español. Antes citó por ahí Esteban el Che Guevara. Y la cita dice así. Las ruinas no nos dan miedo. Sabemos que no vamos a heredar nada más que ruinas. Porque la burguesía, en nuestro caso sería la industria fósil, tratará de arruinar el mundo en la última fase de la historia. Pero a nosotros no nos dan miedo las ruinas, porque llevamos un mundo nuevo en nuestros corazones. Ese mundo está creciendo en este instante. Y nada, muchísimas gracias. No olvidéis de vuestro dato de contacto ahora en la Breaking Rooms. Y un abrazo muy grande y mucha furia a todas. Thank you, Bilbo. Sorry for keeping you short, um, but that's just how long our interpreters have time to do the interpretation, which is a super hard job to do, but they're doing a really, really good job, as all of us could hear today. And um, I don't want to keep them longer as they should. So as Bilbo said, if you want to join us, there's different ways. Um, please stay right now we're going to do some breakout rooms so you can learn more about what's happening in your region but also there is a weekly meeting for inductions so you can learn more about scientist rebellion every monday i put the link in the chat and you can also email us at any time if you want to join and don't know how to but um now we have time for breakout rooms and we're looking forward to meeting you and talking to you and and learning from you.